to dive right in. Um, I woke up this morning to a very interesting, um, I thought it was really interesting. I think I was really deceiving and it just made me kind of think of what angle are they trying here? But the New York Times came out with a rent versus buy calculator. And I'm gonna share it with you just in a second here, but it was the most blatant, you should never buy, you should always rent, become a renter nation like ad that I've ever seen. Um, so know, know this, 90% of millionaires became millionaires through real estate. And then we get New York Times putting together a buy versus rent calculator that looks like this. So I'm going to share this with you real fast. And we're going to dive right in. And then we're going to get into kind of what rates are doing this week. But this is the New York Times buy versus rent calculator. You can Google this, buy versus rent calculator, New York Times. It automatically defaults to a $500,000 purchase price compared to a $2,000 in rent. Now, mind you, you can't find a $500,000 home that has a mortgage even anywhere close. You're probably about $4,000 on the mortgage compared to rent. So that's a bad comparison to start with. Uh, but then they say renting saves you $133,000 over 10 years. So you're like, what? So basically, if you dig in deep on this, basically what they're doing is they're saying, okay, if you had the exact same money out of pocket and you put, instead of doing a down payment, you put that money into the stock market and got 10% guaranteed and you took the money you would save rent versus buying and you put that into a, into a savings account and just waited, what would be the, what would be the, what would be most beneficial? They don't take into account appreciation or amortization. So it's just terrible. So anyhow, this is what the media is pushing out and it's really, really awful. So I took this same scenario and I ran it through another buy versus rent calculator that showed um, if you were to like appreciation, like what it would look like. And then also amortization, you're paying yourself part of that mortgage payment, right? And this is what it came out at. So instead of saving $130,000 or whatever in 10 years, you're of a net game of $205,000 in a real-time scenario, taking into appreciation gain and amortization, which is what you pay towards your mortgage. So, and this even takes into consideration if you sold and closing costs. So it takes into everything. So there's just some bad information out there and we need to be aware of how to overcome these obstacles. So if you have anyone that comes to you and says, hey, I, I saw this buy versus rent calculator. I'm never going to buy. This is ridiculous. Um, they're being led astray. So <clears throat> I thought this was absolutely disgusting but you know it's what our media likes to portray because good hey, news Sean, doesn't sell. you're not good and you're not going to be able to rent a five hundred thousand dollar house for two thousand dollars a month no so i mean that's it's a terrible just, comparison right there it's horrible i mean look at this yeah they compare these two five hundred thousand purchase versus two thousand i mean come on people like that's yeah, like a four thousand dollars a month rent yeah, probably no, it's, it's just not realistic and of course I know a lot of people that are conspiracy theorists that think that they're trying to make this nation a renter nation. Now we have builders that are buying, that are building a bunch of different properties and they're not selling them, they're renting them. Uh, there is a lot more money to be made when you hold on to real estate and rent it because you get the, you get the person paying your mortgage for you. You get appreciation on the value of the item. So it makes sense to own real estate. That's why you 90% of the Americans that are millionaires got there through real estate, right? So I don't know. There's small kinds of conspiracies out there. I'm not going to dive into that rabbit hole right now. But yeah, it's really, really bad. This is reality. And if you need one of these reports sent to you, um, if you have any questions on these, I can easily provide these for you. Uh, they only take a couple minutes to run. So last week we talked about what was happening in the week was we had jobs numbers coming out. We had ADP numbers. We had uh, bond auctions happening. We had all of these really important things happening and bond auctions. Remember, if the bond auction goes well, that means that people are thinking, okay, I want to pay. I'm going to buy this bond auction at a higher rate because that's where that, because I think rates are going to come down. So we saw some bond auction results last week.
that basically showed the psychology of the uh, of the buyers of these bonds because they it was a very good auction on the 30 year they were buying a higher rate because they thought that rates are probably going to be lower in the future if you know the rates are going to be higher and you can buy a bond with a higher yield in two or three months you're probably not going to buy a lot of bonds right now it's kind of like if you know something's going to go on sale in a week you don't pay full price for it now you wait well they were paying for what they thought was going to be a higher rate through these auctions I think with a psychology of thinking that rates are going to be coming down. So the bond auctions went well. And then we also saw the U.S. economy uh, through ADP show instead of 240,000 jobs or so that there's expected, only 175,000 came out. Now, we're going to dive into this uh, a little bit deeper here, but even that number is a little inflated because they use this birth versus death ratio of businesses, and they estimate based over the last five years by how many businesses have opened and closed. So if you take into account the average for that, we had COVID in the middle of that. So they threw in, in the last couple of years that they're averaging people, businesses opening at 300,000 new jobs. And that's the number they added here as a fake number based on average. Well, we know they all closed and they all reopened. So is that real? No, it's not. So they're still kind of funky, but it is still less than what was expected. And it probably would have been worse if that birth versus death ratio wasn't there. So let's look at the economy real quick, kind of see what's happening with savings. So this is the overall economy, all right? This kind of tells you where the money's going. And these are really, really good. Uh, you can get these through Fred, um, which is an online Federal Reserve um, numbers. They keep everything. So if you look at the savings rate of Americans, these large spikes here, these were when we received or when the public received stimulus checks during COVID. They went up, then they went down. Stimulus up, went down. Stimulus up, went down. These are exactly the same dates as stimulus. And then we kind of tapered off. And then we started, the savings started being uh, spent. The savings rate was no longer being saving. Now that savings is being spent. And you notice the spending rate just keep, this keeps going down. And then this other over here, the excessive spending, we are now below. We're spending more than we're, we're saving. So not a good sign when you're spending more than you're saving. That's not a good sign. So that's, that's where the overall economy is. So we've exhausted the savings and now we're into credit cards, basically is what that's saying. Um, so we're starting to see the cracks in the economy, right? Uh, that's what the feds wanted. That's what's going to bring rates down. So here's a really, really interesting survey. Um, there's a thing called the buy now, pay later. You can go into Walmart and if you don't have any money, if you've maxed out your credit cards, you can go into Walmart. You can choose the six month payment plan for your groceries. You can do that. And you can put your groceries on basically credit, but this is hidden credit. This, this credit is not being um, reported to any of the credit agencies. So TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax, they aren't reporting this. But of that buy now, pay later, those services, 43% of all of it, and it's in the billions that's being lent out, 43% are now late on those short-term six-month credit cards that are basically. 33% um, of those people that are using them are using it because their credit cards are maxed out. 54% of these people said they, they bought more than they could afford uh, because they could. 24% um, of them said their spending's out of control. Now, might, remember, everyone is used to spending a lot of money during COVID because the money was flowing. Those habits didn't stop, and this is proof. 42% uh, of those households uh, of more than $100,000 a year of income reported being behind or delinquent on these. So that means they're making decent money, but they're still behind. It's still hard. Uh, and that's because these higher rates, everything costs more um, with inflation and everything that's happened. And then 50% are already considered using it to pay their bills and essential items like groceries. So this does not show a really healthy economy, but you turn around and you look at the news, which I'm looking at every day. The economy is strong, employment strong. So the cracks are there. We've talked about it. When will they show up? Let's get into this. So this is the... The, this is the University of Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Report. This goes over and it, goes, it has a massive 
um, survey on what's happening with consumers and how they're feeling about the economy. Well, the headline consumer sentiment number went from a 77.2 to a 67.4 last month. That's over 10 points. It was estimated to drop from 77.2 to 76.2. That's a big gap. The weakest in six months, but it's a huge gap, which is not normal. Um, everyone's expectations for inflation was higher than it was. And they think it's going to stay a little bit higher for a while. In the long run, people think it's going to be right around the 3%. Um, those that are were, like worried about employment, um, they fell 15%. Like, so people worried like they may not have a job. The unemployment, people thought that there's going to be, be higher unemployment in the future than, than the past. So all of these numbers are showing the economy is slowing down recession-like, but it's not being reflected in the news. Um, but this is proof in the pudding as to what is going to be in the future. Now, this might scare you. It shouldn't at all. This should mean good news for real estate for a lot of different reasons. One, because rates will come down because of this, but displacement in the industry, in the real estate, or displacement of employment and moving around the country actually creates opportunity in real estate. So you have to just be sensitive to the fact that people could lose their jobs, but there's probably going to be a job opening as well, because there are quite a few job openings, even though a lot of them are short term. Uh, but this is really, really good to know because this shows what's happening in our economy, in the economy, and what's going to be happening in the future. So this was the BLS jobs numbers. We kind of talked about this. Um, they 175,000 new jobs were created. 240 was the estimate. Um, the birth diff versus death ratio, that's that 363,000. That's an ambiguous number that was just thrown in there because of an average of how many jobs have opened and closed over the last five years. It's an arbitrary number. So if you took that away and just went off just the new ADP filings, or I'm sorry, just the BLS jobs report fi findings, it would be a negative 100,000 or so. It'd be really, really low. And that would be a job loss, um, not in gain. So really interesting numbers. Uh, we're going to really pay attention to this as we continue. Because remember, guys, I told you, this is the uh, canary in the coal mine that's going to bring the interest rates down. This is what the Fed's going to be looking at. And this is what the Feds are going to be determined because inflation's sticky. It's kind of going to be stuck at three for a while. This is what's going to bring them to drop rates sooner rather than later. Uh, again, here's the breakdown for more of the jobs numbers so I just went over. So here's another interesting thing. The hourly earnings is going is not doing well. So the hourly earnings actually is going down. The number of work hours worked is going down. Um, year over year, we're down at, we're at 3.9 versus 4.1. So um, it's it's not a it's not a very these aren't good numbers. So basically people are working for a little bit less and they're not working as much. Um, these are the job numbers of where the money, where the money is going as far as the new jobs, leisure and hospitality. That was up like 80,000 jobs in the last report. It's only five now. The government was like 70,000. As you can remember, they're basically copying and pasting these numbers from the previous jobs reports. Um, finally, they're coming through saying, yeah, only 8,000 government jobs are being reported. Construction's down. Uh, healthcare was a real big rise. Um, that just means that more costs of healthcare when there's more costs when there's more employers, there's more things. I mean, healthcare inflation and, and, and insurance and that kind of stuff has gotten kind of crazy. Uh, social assistance, that's all of the, um, well, there's a lot of different jobs in that category is way high as well, but still very low compared to what, um, what it was supposed to be. So quantitative tightening, where are we right now? This is what the feds are doing right now. They're tightening the economy. Quantitative easing was when the money was flowing. Quantitative tightening is when the money is being pulled back and there's less money in the system. So the reason I'm going over what that means, removing money from the financial markets to stem dangers posed by overheating economy. So if there's inflation, they're gonna tighten the economy, okay? And that makes it harder, less money, so on and so forth. So here's some numbers that I I'm going over. This is QE. Now, the feds have already said they're going to slow down the balance sheet reduction. So QE right here, if you can see here, I'm QE is when they were easing. 
the government was buying mortgage-backed securities and treasuries at a massive rep. What happened in 2020 to interest rates? If you remember, they were it was like a crazy, like what is going on? They dropped so fast because the, they flooded the markets with money. They're buying mortgage-backed securities and they were buying, 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 buying very rapidly. And they continued to buy, 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 buy. And rates hit incredible lows. And money was flowing. Money was cheap. They did this on purpose to ease through what the pandemic was. And then they slowed their roll. And then they started tightening. Now, they started tightening this, meaning they were now selling off the, the treasuries that they were buying. So if you buy them and rates get better, what happens when you sell them? They get worse. And you can see rate, they were selling, 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 quantitative tightening. And now guess what they just announced? They announced that they're going to start repurchasing in June. So what does that mean for you and I? That means these numbers right here, this graph is going to go up again because they're going to be repurchasing and they're going to be buying back treasuries that they sold for the first time in 20 years, starting in June 29th. So um, exciting news ahead of us for that. That could really, really help mortgage rates. So if we have that coupled with employment numbers, unemployment numbers rising, uh, fractures in our economy, making a little slower economy, we could see the potential for rates to slowly come down and hopefully start a trend um, and overall uh, weakening of our economy to move forward. So where are we with mortgage rates now? What is that doing for us today? Well, let's look to see what the markets did last week. So last week, let's just start back here. Uh, the first of the week, this was when um, we saw a really big rebound here, but we pierced through when we had a, on the beginning of the next week, we pierced through this Fibonacci level. Mortgage bonds improved, then they improved again. Uh, this was the bond auction. These were the ADP numbers. I mean, the, it was just a good week overall. Uh, I'm sorry, the BLS jobs numbers. It was a good week overall because the bond auctions went well. So we saw this big improvement in rates, uh, probably in a three eighths better in rate in just three days. That's a very good. But then we bounced around in this range. Look at that up, down, up, down, up, down, up. We are bouncing, but we're trying to get through this Fibonacci level. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens this week. We've got a lot going on. I'll talk about that in just a second. But we're trying to pierce. We went through it once, twice, three times, four times. We went through it, but we never have closed above this. We need to close above this. Um, so that's where we're at right now. We had a really good gain. If you can see what the impact is, guys, on employment and the bonds, that's proof in the pudding right now with just good good low employment numbers or, or higher unemployment numbers, what that does for mortgage rates. So where are we with actual rates? This is 800 credit score, 10% down, 300 loan amount. This is kind of the meat and potatoes of the Valley um, of Arizona. So we're at about seven and a quarter with an 800 credit score, 10% down. This is based on the overall average for the country, this is not my rates. This is just the overall average. So you can kind of see where things are. Now, I like to do this one because I change the credit score and just the credit score. And I leave everything else the same on this calculator. At a 740, you are 7.462 on a conventional 30-year fixed compared to the 7.291. So you're down 40 basis points. You're still a good credit score, but you're a quarter higher in rate. But look at FHA. It's nice and low still at seven. It's almost unchanged. See that from 800 credit score to 740, unchanged. FHA doesn't have loan level adjustments like conventional rates Conventional rates do for credit scores. So as you progress lower in your credit score, and we're going to go to the next screen, 680, you're at almost 8% on a conventional loan. We're still only 7.1 on an FHA. So why do people with lower credit scores gravitate, gravitate towards FHA? Because the rate is significantly better. Um, so don't discount the fact that an FHA is still very approvable loan. An approval loan versus an approval loan, there's no benefit or, or there's no way reason for a seller to, to say no to an FHA other than really bad inspection issues. If you're an approval, it's an approval. So accept those FHA offerings because they're still approved loans. Um, and if you go really low on credit, 
you're really bad on conventional and you're starting to see the higher rates on the FHA as well. So we're in the low sevens to high, high eights or low eights, depending on your credit scores. Um, but we're much better than we were. So what's happening this week? Um, and then we're going to go into some zero down programs. Uh, we have the producer price index, which is a really good indicator on what the feds are going to be talking about when they discuss um, the rate cuts and when they discuss their, their kind of plans moving forward. Um, that is the inflation number. That's tomorrow. So we have the producer price index, PPI, very influential number. So we could see, hopefully, um, it's. I think it's going to be flat. I think these numbers won't change. Uh, the CPI index uh, is next on Wednesday. So big inflation uh, week for us. And then retail sales in the afternoon, which if you follow where the money's going and you follow the fact that people are still spending, retail sales should stay the same because they're still spending. They're maxed out and now they're using other things. I think it's going to be a little slower, but that could be good news. If we see slowing down of retail sales, we can it'll help mortgage rates. Um, and then we have the manufacturing survey coming out on Thursday and then jobless claims coming out. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see the building permits and the housing starts because as you slow down in the economy, that's when builders start to slow down as well. Um, so we'll see how that um, is being impacted as we go through. So now what's next? Zero down loans. So I'm going to get into this because as people spend their savings, they're depleting their money for down payment. So if you look at the overall trend of what people are doing with their money and that savings that they had for COVID is being depleted, where's the money? They don't have the money. Believe me, I'm seeing it in prequels, guys. A lot of people have work, they have good income, but they just don't have money. Um, but they still want to buy. So we have a lot of zero down programs. Uh, we've got a wealth builder loan that is zero down jumbo loan up to 1.15 million for rounding up purposes here. Uh, you do need a 780 credit score. If you have a 680, we go down to the conventional loan limit, but it's a 100% loan. It's a 20 year term, which means you're going to rapidly pay that off. So we call it wealth builder loan because you're paying yourself and you're going to be creating a lot more equity, a lot faster. Uh, we have the powerhouse 100, which can be used for any human being in the country that has a 720 credit score buying a primary home. There's no income limits. There's no regulation on where you are in the United States. It's not county specific. There's no limitations at all except for credit score. And it's a true conventional zero down loan. So fantastic loan product. That's our own. Um, we also have an FHA zero down program that is our own where we fund the second mortgage. So it's a 3.5% down, but we do, we do that second mortgage for them. So they don't have to bring in any down payment assistance program that have golden handcuffs. Um, it's our program. Yes, there's a payment on it, but it's hundred percent financing and there's no limitations on income. You don't have to be a first time home buyer to use it. Uh, you can do manufactured homes on this program. All you need is a 600 credit score. It follows FHA normal rules. So it's for everybody. And all you need is a 600 credit score to do a zero down loan. And it's not specific to counties. There's no income limits, like requirements. There's no, if you refinance in two years, you have to pay some of it back. It is a 100% financed FHA loan. It is a phenomenal product. Um, and then also we do have the down payment assistance programs. We have home in five, we have home plus plus, we have the Arizona is home. We have the Tucson programs, uh, which is the home buyer solution lighthouse program. There's a lot of zero down options. We're going to dive in a lot deeper in our lunch and loan on this, but, uh, a lot of options. So if somebody says they don't have any money, um, you don't have to be stuck in a grant program. There's de definitely alternatives for this, or if they have the money, they just don't want to put it down. We can look at what reinvesting that money is and putting zero down can look like. So here's some rates just to kind of show you where these rates are. This is the um, platinum, home and five platinum. Now we looked back, if you look at, back at a few slides, we were in about the 7% range for FHA and VA. But look at this program, guys, the home and five platinum. All you need is a 640. The locked rate is six and a quarter. This is a phenomenal rate. So 
If you have anyone that's on the fence because of rates, you can get a down payment assistance program at 6.25. Now, mind you, there are some handcuffs on these, meaning it's a grant. If you refinance it in a year and a half, you have to pay a portion of it back. Um, but it's a phenomenal rate. So if you look down here below here, there's another, the home plus, the home bond, the Arizona's home bond. Um, you look at these rates, we're down in the fives, in the sixes. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, if you have somebody that is torn up on the rates right now and they're a first time home buyer, let's get them into these bond programs. Now, Arizona is home, is not in Maricopa County. So that's where we would need to use the home and five platinum. But phenomenal programs, guys. Uh, yes, there's some golden handcuffs to these. Yes, there's stipulations where you can't refinance it for a certain amount of time without paying some back. But there's alternatives to that and there's ways around that kind of stuff too. So let's look at these as alternatives to people that are on the fence. So that's a little bit about those zero down programs. Again, I'm going to go into those a lot more detail in our lunch and loan. And now I'm going to open it to any questions that you guys may have regarding what's happening with rates, the crazy buy versus rent stuff that we're seeing with the New York Times, uh, the cracks in our economy that are finally showing through the through the data, which the feds can't ignore anymore. Um so that's really, really good news. I think we're in a good place for what the future brings in rates. Will it be a very fast decline? Probably not, but will it decline? Yes, but it's not going to go straight down. It'll be like, do 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 like up and down. So we'll see little spikes here and there. But as long as this these numbers continue to come out like this and they're they're being truthful, I think we should see nice lower rates in the future, but it's not going to be fast um, unless some radical numbers come up. So any questions, Any anything that you guys have that you're seeing in the marketplace that you have questions on that we can jump into right now? Feel free to jump in the chat as well. So some bad news in the economy, but good news for interest rates in the near future is what I think. Um, we could be taken totally sideways by a hotter than expected inflation number, but um, hopefully we'll continue to see this get better and better for rates. All right, quiet morning. Everyone's all partied out with all of the food and, and fun from Mother's Day. And we had Cinco de Mayo last week, or not, it was two weeks ago, right? About a week, a little bit more than a week ago. All right, guys, well, if there's no questions, you guys enjoy your week, and uh, we'll keep your fing our fingers crossed that the inflation numbers this week are tame. Hopefully they'll beat expectations and they'll be lighter than expected. And we'll see a little bit more rally with these mortgage rates. So enjoy your week, guys. Have a great day. And uh, go ahead and check out the website, bullandmortgageteam.com for the next webinars, for all of the good stuff that we offer. Thank you, Sean. Absolutely. You guys have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks, Sean.